as we come down in history, there's two people that really, really stand out in Japan. One of them was a a Soto monk by the name of Ryokan. The other was a very recently living monk who lived in the 18th century, so that's very recent, named Hakuan. Now, Ryokan was extraordinary because uh, this is before monks married. That happened about 130, 140 years ago during the Meiji Restoration. Uh, the monks, what the government did was try to laicize all the Buddhist monks so there were no monks anymore. And uh, so they told them they all had to get married. They told them they all had to eat meat. Emperor's command. So the monks got married, the monks ate meat, and the monks continued to live in temple and teach the Dharma. And so the emperor was defeated. And and there was a, a period of about 20 years where the emperor waited for Buddhism to fall apart, and it didn't. The only thing that happened is the temples started to fall apart because all government support of the temples was withdrawn. Then somebody woke up one day and said, well, they're not going to go away. These Buddhist guys, I don't understand it. How can they stay around when there's no glory and no fame and no money in this? See, because they never understood Buddhism. So then they decided maybe we'll use them to help spread uh, goodwill and the teachings of the government because the emperor had been put back on the throne in Japan. He'd been off for hundreds of years. And so now, uh, anytime you hear anybody talk about a Buddhist university in Japan, they were all started within about 10 years of each other, and that was when the emperor decided maybe he could use Buddhism. So they established universities, and one of the things the monks had to do was take a course in emperor. And then they were supposed to propagate. <laughs> yeah, they were supposed to propagate, you know, what the, the kind of the cult of the emperor. Um, but that was okay, because now, now the monks, you know, they, they weren't outcasts anymore, because they very much were for a while. Before that time, we still have celibate monks, you know, as the norm, uh, monks that don't have a great lo- a great deal. Not that there weren't monks that weren't rich. I mean, the, the, the history of man is the history of exceptions and the history of abuses and, a, and and all kinds of things. But typically, a monk didn't have a whole lot. And uh, this monk Ryokan, who was a Soto monk, after his formal training was done, he went off and lived in a little little hut behind a temple that was falling down and his primary practice was Zazen and visiting with the village children and so he's very famous because he always carried a ball of twine in the big sleeve I don't wear big you know like my yellow robe has a big sleeve well my Japanese robe had an enormous sleeve it was so big that if I put my arms down it touched the ground I always had to keep my arms up here I always thought the reason the sleeves were so big is to teach young people not to put their arms down. And so he would always carry at least one, sometimes two or three balls of twine. And so he could play ball with the children. And he liked to drink. And so there are some stories about him falling asleep, you know, and uh, not waking up when he should have. Uh, there's a great story about him playing hide-and-seek with the children, and he hid inside a crate, and they, they, they went and found him the next day. And uh, everybody, they got worried about him, and everybody said, where did he go? What happened to the monk? And they found him in a crate, and they said, "What are you, Master, what are you doing in here? And he said, well, the children haven't found me yet. Yeah, he was sober, but he... <laughs> but Ryokan... If you like poetry, go to the bookstore and uh, you can get some, they've got two or three books of his poetry out there. And it's the real Zen stuff, Sandy. It's the real Zen stuff. He's a great poet and prolific. One of the, the stories of Real Khan that just explains who he was is that one night a bandit broke into his hut and <laughs> found nothing because he had nothing. And Ryokan returned home and surprised the bandit. And the bandit, of course, just imagine how a bandit would be acting. He's in this cornered in this little hut of this poverty monk. And Ryokan took off his robe and gave it to him. 
because he said, I don't want you to leave empty handed. (laughs) And then he wrote a poem about it. And he says, sitting before my window, cold, the moon is my blanket. So Ryokan was extraordinary. Ryokan liked to go out and just teach the village people. So, and, and we know that when people needed ceremonies, when there were funerals, when there were blessings, he would go and do those things. But he lived this very, very simple life. Even when the temple in front of him, they, somebody decided to go ahead and kind of rebuild it and get it functioning again, Ryokan continued to live in that little hut behind the temple, surrounded by pine trees. 